Evening, everyone. It's our beginning of our last week of class. Um, I have your test for tomorrow here. And I think it's a good one. I think I might, might trip some of you guys up finally. Well, we'll see anyway. Okay, um, let's see. Uh, no news from campus other than nobody's allowed to go over there. Um, I might go, I do have to go over there for something, Tara knows, so. Um, anyway, so for today, we are gonna be talking about second order differential equations. So let's uh, share the screen here. And there we go. Note. This was from then. All right. So second order differential equations. Okay. Okay, so on the COR, which is uh, what's on file at the state, um, this topic is included in our Math 185 COR, as it is also included in Santa Ana College and Saddleback. For some reason, the Stewart textbook has stopped including that last chapter. Okay, so you either gonna, now at department meetings, we've all decided that we need to stick to the COR as best we can. And Math 285, it's a disaster. The, the COR it would take a year to get through that stuff. Okay, so let's start with some definitions here. Okay, so definition, a general second order linear differential equation is a differential equation of the form or equivalent to, make sure I'm not talking to myself. You guys hear me, somebody? Yep, yeah, we're, we're here. You're here, okay. Okay, so here's what it looks like. So it's gonna be some A2 of X, Y double prime plus a one of x times y prime plus a zero of x times y equals some function of x. Okay, now linear means that we're linear in the y stuff. It doesn't matter how gnarly these a two, a one, and a zero guys are. They could be hyperbolics, they could be logarithms, it doesn't make any difference, okay? The thing that motivated us to study these differential equations in the first place was in fact a second order differential equation. We had a differential equation that looked like omega zero squared y equaling zero, okay? Okay, so 
more to the definition here. That's a symbol, right? Omega squared. Oh, okay. I won't yeah, anymore. omega zero squared. I believe it was the spring constant over the mass, right? Oh, I think okay. that's what it was. Okay. And so when we want to indicate something as positive, we usually refer to it as omega squared. Okay, so if the function f of x is identically equal to zero, and we have the differential equation a2 of x, y double prime, a1 of x, y prime, plus a zero of x, y equals zero. This is called a homogeneous. differential equation, set it equal to zero, okay? All right, now, we've gotta have some theorem existence and uniqueness stuff. So let's just get it out of the way, theorem. Um, the IVP, Um, given by a2 of x y double prime plus a1 of x y prime plus a0 of x y equals f of x together with conditions that y of x zero equals y zero and y prime of x zero equals y one has a unique solution on some interval. I'm being real loose with the terms here. Okay. Okay, now for the first order existence and uniqueness theorem, I told you that the proof was almost within your grasp. As soon as this chapter 11 stuff starts to sink in a little bit more, and let's say you're taking um, math 285 or certainly by the time you're a junior, if you try to go through that proof for the first order, you probably can do it with just a little bit of guidance. Um, I do here. However, this proof is way too hard. This is, I took a class called, it was a senior level class called differential equations. Cal Poly Pomona, I think it was math 432. And it was given by Professor Anlin, who was your prototypical, like, they, they, would use, they, they would use him as a dorky math professor character in that show community that I watch. I mean, he was just weird, but really smart. Anyways, all of this stuff gets proven by converting these problems into problems about operators. And there's a big result that happened in the, I think it's the 50s called the Breyer fixed point, Brouwer fixed point theorem that simplified a lot of the proofs, but still we're quite a ways away. Okay, now in general, Here's how this goes. If I start with my a2y double prime, a1y prime, and all of this is of, of x, I'm just getting lazy. This differential equation, step number one, 
we solve the associated homogeneous equation, A2Y double prime, A1Y prime, A0Y equals zero, okay? And then step two, we use the solutions we find to cook up the general solution. Okay. Now I'm doing this at the level of this book. All, this kind of stuff can be proven real easily. Um, and it, it turns out that here's a result. Now this is something I actually prove in the Math 285 class. Okay, so the result is that if you're given this a2 of x, y double prime, a1 of x, y prime, a0 of x, y equals zero, there exists two solutions y1 and y2, which are not multiples of each other. Now in math 285, we call these, we say these two are linearly independent. Okay, so Eduardo, you might as well start writing these terms down. And all of you that are taking math 285 in the fall. You should probably not ignore all this because the second time through, I, I mean, I don't know everybody's style. I know that Stan seems to be a little rough. People seem to like Tyler, Mariana, kind of Mary Poppins-ish. Um, but at least, you, you know, you'll have you'll have all of the, uh, you know, the terms, okay? Okay, so like, just to, just to show you this, let's verify that Y1 equaling sine X is a solution and Y2 equal cosine X is a solution. So you take two derivatives of sine and you get negative sine, right? take two derivatives of cosine, you get negative cosine. Okay, so now notice that those two guys aren't multiples of each other. Okay. Okay, so the of x stuff, this is where the power series stuff is gonna come into play. Okay, the topic that we wanna look at are linear, second order homogeneous differential equations with constant coefficients. Okay. So we're going to be looking at a two y double prime plus a one y prime plus a zero y equals zero, where a zero, a one, and a two. These are just going to be real numbers. Okay. So let's look at an example of one such thing. Okay, now again, there's a way to theorem proof all of this stuff and climb up to getting the answers. The, the reason that, that the study of differential equations is so closely tied with linear algebra is because the solution sets of all of these differential equations that I've been writing end up being finite dimensional vector spaces that's linear algebra shit. 
And so what we try to do is bring to bear everything that we can from linear algebra when we start studying the differential equations. At Cal Poly Pomona 30 some odd years ago, you had to take math 208, which was linear algebra, before you could take math 216, which was differential equations. I'm quite certain the history of this class, math 285, it started off as just a differential equations class. And then Art Moore and Angie Sagalo and Sandra Savage, they kind of changed it into this hybrid thing that Berkeley had been experimenting with, okay? So hopefully your, your professor will do all of the linear algebra stuff before they do the differential equation stuff. Okay, now, what we're gonna do is we're gonna guess what a solution would be. A solution is y equals something. I remember one day in my quantum mechanics class as a senior, senior level physics course, Professor Siegel said, okay, so we're gonna guess this to be an answer. And I, I was offended. I thought, wait, you don't guess? There's a process you go through. This is the math major in me talking. And well, Peter puts, his, puts the chalk down. He goes, Bobby, you gotta realize that guessing is the most popular form of, of solving things. Now, of course, you know, we're gonna do it with educated guesses, but nevertheless, we're still guessing. Okay, so if we guess that y is equal to maybe some power of, of m, uh, some power of x, then y prime would be mx to the m minus one, and y double prime would be m, m minus one, x to the m minus two. All of these exponents are different. So if I plug them in, there's no way that this could work, okay? So back to the drawing board, bad guess. Next guess. Well, let's see. We need a function that when we take its derivative can be combined with itself. It's not gonna work with these polynomial things. It's not gonna work with sine and cosine. But if we were to guess that y was equal to e to the mx, we might have a chance at this, okay? So with this guess, then y prime is going to be m e to the mx, and y double prime is going to be m squared e to the mx. Okay. Now we're going to plug in. We're going to have m squared e to the mx plus 3m e to the mx plus 2 e to the mx equals 0. Okay, now if we were to divide everything by e to the mx, which is non-zero, we arrive at an equation, which is called an auxiliary equation. We would get m squared plus 3m plus 2 equals 0. So here's how you read this. If y is equal to e to the mx, is a solution of the differential equation, then m 
must satisfy m squared plus 3m plus 2 equals 0. Isn't that m plus 2 times m plus 1? Yep. And then it just turns into a stupid factoring problem. So m is equal to negative 1 or negative 2. So we have two solutions here, e to the negative x and y2 equaling e to the negative 2x. Now these are different from each other. We will find later that they are what are called linearly independent. We have a way of checking that with functions. It's a, it's a procedure or it's a thing you plug in called the Ronskian. Okay. And so the general solution, remember we have to have two arbitrary constants. Y is going to be C1 e to the negative x c2 e to the negative 2x. Okay, now in general, this is very easy. In general, if I've got a y double prime plus b y prime plus c y equals zero. By doing this business again and shoving it into this differential equation, we get the auxiliary equation, which is just going to be this quadratic in M. Which we know everything about, don't we boys and girls? We know that M must be negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. Okay, so there are some cases to consider. Case number one, the discriminant of this thing is positive. That means there are two real solutions, M1 and M2. And by the way, if you're not clever enough to know what they are, negative B plus the square root of B squared minus 4AC over 2A and m2 is negative b minus the square root of b squared 4ac all over 2a. And so the general solution, y to c1e to the m1x plus c2e to the m2x. And because m1 doesn't equal m2, we know that these two guys are easy. So some, depending on who you start with, you might like what I do in Math 285, I go through first order differential equations like what we did last week for a couple of days. I spend more time with it because there's more to talk about, okay? And then I don't even do this second order stuff. Then I go into all the linear algebra and then come back. Some people will go to here next, okay? In my opinion, that's not a good way to do it, but in any event, that's what we get. Okay, now case number two, b squared minus 4ac is negative. This means that we have complex roots of our auxiliary. Okay, now, 
because complex because the the polynomial um, be, because the auxiliary equation we are assuming that these numbers are real numbers so complex roots come in conjugate pairs okay so we have complex conjugate roots. So if Z1, I've already used A and B. So let's say I'll use U and V. If U plus, I don't want to use A and V, I'll use S and T. S plus I T, then Z2 is going to be S minus I T. Okay, now, oh, look, it looks like I've been writing. It looks like shit, kind of right there. That was not intended. Okay, so now, Remember that Euler's formula thing that we talked about last time? We know that we have two solutions, W1 equaling E to the Z1X and W2 equaling E to the Z2X. So if I was to write, if I just track the first one around, this is gonna be E to the S plus I T. <laughs> X, excuse me on that one. Bless you. Which I'm gonna write as E to the S X times E to the I T X. Okay, now I'm gonna use Euler's formula. It's equal to E to the SX times cosine of TX plus I times the sine of TX. Now doing a similar thing with W2, it's gonna be E to the SX, but this time it's cosine of negative tx. Well, that's the same as cosine of tx. And then sine of negative tx, well, the minus comes through the sine because it's odd. Okay. Now, for you guys that are going on the graduate school path and eventually maybe in engineering, math, or physics, at some point you get comfortable with looking at solutions that look like this and like this. Most of the time, however, you have to de-imaginary them, okay? So again, here's a result from linear algebra that says, if W1 and W2 are linearly independent solutions, of the above differential equation, then W1 plus W2, half of W1 plus half of W2 is a solution and W1 minus W2 divided by 2i is a solution. And notice that when you do this stuff, we'll call y1 this W1 plus W2 over 2. And so what you get is e to the sx times the cosine of tx. And then y2 is going to be e to the sx times the sine 
of Tx. Now this this stuff is uh, this stuff is actually kind of easy. Okay, so let's let's try an example here. Y double prime plus y prime plus y equals zero. So the auxiliary equation is going to be m squared plus m plus one equals zero. Complex roots are, are going to be negative b plus or minus, that's a one, square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. Okay, so our complex roots are m equaling negative one half plus or minus i radical three over two. By the way, Eduardo, yeah. the, these two numbers are what are called the primitive third roots of unity. If you start with this equation, m cubed minus one equals zero, it'll factor into m minus one, m squared plus m plus one. When this number is prime, the roots of the resulting what's called cyclotomic polynomial are all primitive, what are called pth roots. So if you, if you were to take the first one, like M1, make sure we all understand there's two numbers here. If you were to square this guy, you would get the next one, which would be the minus sign. And if you squared the minus sign one, you would get the plus sign one. And of course, if you cube them, you're gonna get one. Okay. Oh. Okay, so anyways, here's what we know. Y1 is gonna be e to the negative one half x times the cosine of radical three over two x and then y2 is going to be e to the negative one half x um, times the sine of radical three over two x. And be careful where you're putting the x. Make sure it doesn't go underneath the radical. Okay, so this stuff is actually pretty easy, right? Now on tests, I put the problem so that all of the complex numbers and you know this is all ugly looking answers okay we have a third case to consider and this is the case when the discriminant remember we have m equaling negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. And in this case, the b squared minus 4ac is equal to zero. So that means we only have one root. It's a double root. Anybody want to tell me what it is? Before I give it away. The root of this. Just look at the information. It's minus b plus. It's the same, it's the same problem. It's just, you're doing one and then doing the other one as negative. Look at b squared minus 4ac is zero, right? Exactly. So if this whole thing is zero, isn't m just negative b over 2a? Yeah. Yeah. Don't you, don't you feel crummy about yourself that you didn't figure that out? Yeah. Every, every, year, every year when we get to this spot, I do the same thing in the 285 class. Okay. I go, I go, anybody want to tell me what it is? 
and they'll sit there and go, oh, oh. and then as soon as I look, it's zero. Then everybody feels like shit. Why didn't I see it? Okay, well, now you've seen it, all right? Weird things happen in differential equations where I'll write a whole thing that will, you know, start here and end up on two boards later over here. And I'll go, aha, but see, all this is zero. Okay. Okay, well, anyways, so back to this. We have one solution. Y1 equaling E to the MX. Okay, now, what you do is you set y2 equal to x e to the mx and you verify that it works okay so what you do is you just throw an x in front of it got it okay so let's let's try this so i've got y double prime minus 2y prime plus y equals zero. The auxiliary equation is m squared minus 2m plus one equals zero. Now, when we're doing this in the 285 class, I tell them, don't make more out of this than is here. Okay, it is nothing more than a quadratic formula factoring problem. Okay, so y1 is e to the x. So apparently y2 equals x e to the x. Okay, now, again, I theorem proof this stuff in the 285 class. When I saw this stuff in, as a sophomore, uh, he didn't even theorem proof it. He was barely using the terminology of linear independent stuff. In books, you see the principle of superpositioning and so on. Okay, so we know the y1 is going to work. We're checking y2. Okay, so y2 prime is equal to e to the x plus x e to the x. y2 double prime is going to be e to the x plus e to the x plus x e to the x, right? So if I take y double prime minus two y prime plus y, it's gonna be two e to the x plus x e to the x minus two e to the x plus x e to the x plus e to the x, and that's 2 e to the x, x e to the x, minus 2 e to the x, minus 2 x e to the x, plus x e to the x, 2 e to the x minus 2 e to the x, 1, 2, cancel. Holy smokes, it works. Okay, now, Technically, you know, you can go up to, uh, you know, third order, fourth order, third order, and as long as you can factor stuff, you know, like, let's say I had this guy where I had um, Y triple prime plus three y double prime plus three y prime plus y equals zero. The auxiliary, it's all the same, m cubed plus three m squared plus three m plus one equals zero. And isn't that m plus one cubed isn't that how it would go pascal's triangle right okay so we have y1 equaling m is negative one e to the negative x now we need two other solutions so what ends up happening is you throw an x in front of every one of them 
Now it turns out that you could also throw any linear function in front. For this guy right here, it turns out you could put any quadratic in front, okay? Now that all comes out, you see it in the proof. Okay, so that's my advertisement to take Math 285. And who knows, if, if Art can't do it, you know, I might end up having to do it. Okay, so now at the end of Math 285, when we're talking about systems of differential equations, we revisit this idea. And I say, remember when we just threw an X on in front? Now let's throw a completely general linear in front. That's actually what we're trying to do. Okay, so non-homogeneous. Okay, so we still have constant coefficients. A1 y prime plus A0 y equals sum f of x. Okay, now, here's what we know. There exists two linearly independent, mean non-multiples of each other, solutions of a2 y double prime plus a1 y prime plus a0 y equals zero. Okay, let's call them y1 and y2. Okay, now hopefully by now you're realizing this, that finding these things, a, a sixth grader could do this, as long as they've had algebra too, you know, and you tell them what the double prime means, you know, you, they don't even need to understand that, okay? Okay, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to use a technique How do you spell technique? Tech equa. Use a technique called variation of parameters. to use y1 and y2 to get the general solution. Okay, so that's just like me that telling it in words. Okay, so now here is the result. And again, this result, I end up in Math 285 proving about four or five times. That's a fair ball. Yep. Let's do this. Now, okay, so we let off with a double. Now the trout's not in the two hole, they won't punk him. Let's put trout in the three hole. Okay, so here's the result. Um, suppose, that y1 and y2 are linearly independent solutions of, we even have a shorter way of writing all this stuff down. We just call it ly, where l is the operator, a2, two derivatives, a1, one derivative, a zero, no derivatives, equals zero. And y sub p is any particular solution of the non-homogeneous differential equation then 
the general solution to the differential equation is given by y, which is c1 y1, c2 y2, plus this particular solution. Okay, now maybe at the end of class after everybody leaves, I can scroll back and Eduardo, you can write the proof of this thing down real quick or anybody for that matter, because you're gonna see it so many times, okay? Okay, now this sounds like it might be begging the question. Like, let's say that we're trying to solve this thing. Okay, it seems pretty hopeful thinking, wishful thinking here that we just know offhand of, okay, there's a base hit. Oh, he wasn't at second, so now we're at first. And, oh, don't go to second, you idiot. Get tagged out. I'm going to walk her out for double play. Stupid base running. Okay, so this seems like, okay, why would you expect that? Well, I have, it may very well be, that, you know, that you know through experimenting. Here's how the story of quantum mechanics happened. Back around the, you know, shortly after, Einstein had had presented his relativity papers. Everybody was still waiting for verification uh, through the solar eclipse stuff. Um, this quantum mechanics, which everyone accepted, every by the way, Einstein got his Nobel Prize for the photoelectric effect, which is quantum mechanics stuff. And Einstein never believed in quantum mechanics. He says God, God doesn't play dice with the universe. So kind of a kind of strange irony. Anyways, uh, a French mathematician named de Broglie was doing his PhD thesis and he thought, well, you know, there's this dual nature of light, like light acts like a wave, but it also acts like a particle, maybe particles have a dual nature as well. And he writes up what the wave function would have to be in order for this to work. And according to Professor Siegel, like this being the wave function, and you know, it's a R theta, usually do it in spherical coordinates, or you could do it in X, Y, Z, but it's much easier to switch coordinates. But anyways, he just comes up with his, with, his, with his thing, okay? And everybody thinks it's a joke until Einstein reads his paper and says, you know what, I think this guy De Broglie is onto something. And then everybody pats him on the back. And Trump got a hit, yeah. Yeah, good job, De Broglie. Okay, so then Erwin Schrodinger comes along and he says, okay, I'm gonna cook up a differential equation that has de Broglie's wave function as one of the solutions, okay? And so from there, he cooked up a differential equation. Now through the theory, he knows there's gonna be more solutions, okay? And I went through this as a sophomore. So for you guys that are gonna be taking modern physics with us, you might go through the derivation of the Schrodinger equation. Professor Siegel did it for us as, as sophomores. So next time I, we have a division meeting coming up pretty soon, I'll ask the boss or one of the physics professors if we do that. Okay, it also might be that this comes from an experiment, like you're, you, you're observing something, you observe that this YP shows up. Okay, so then you use your theory, you know, to cook up the rest of it. Okay, so what we're gonna do is we're going to use y1 and y2 to cook up some yp. Okay, now when I say some yp, it is. We're gonna be making choices along the way and so on and so forth. Okay, so what we'll do 
is we're going to look at um, a couple things. All right. So hold on a second. Let me. Some reason my pen just said it's dead. Um, okay, well, back. okay, so what we'll do, no, no, it's not back. No, it's back. Okay, so let's set yp equal to u1 y1 plus u2. Oh, Rendon Homer. Three nothing with one out. Why does this hit the spot? Of course, our bullpen will lose this lead. U2, Y2. Okay. Where U1 and U2 are functions to be determined. Okay, so the condition on YP is that it must satisfy the differential equation. That means that A2 YP double prime plus A1 YP prime plus A0 YP equals this F of X. Now we have two unknown parameters here, U1 and U2. If I start taking derivatives like YP prime, I'm going to have U1 prime y1 plus u1 y1 prime. Then I'm going to have u2 prime y2 plus u2 y2 prime. That's four pieces. And then when I go to do the second derivative here, I'm now going to have eight pieces, right? Okay, now we have two unknown things, U1 and U2. How many conditions on two unknowns do you need to solve for them? Three. How many conditions if you have two unknowns? One. Here are two unknowns. How many solutions are there to this equation? Infinitely many, right? But what if I give you another condition? They're gonna chase this guy after. Now, how many solutions are there? There's only the one solution, three, one. So to, to know, if we're trying to find two unknown things, we need two conditions, okay? Only one condition is forced on us and it's this one right here, okay? So we are free to pick a second condition. Now the condition that I wanna pick here is this guy plus this guy equals zero. We're gonna set U1 prime Y1 plus U2 prime Y2 equal to zero. Now the reason for this is because we don't want double derivatives of the U thing.
okay? So now let's do the next derivative and plug in. Yp double prime, that's gonna be u1 prime y1 plus u1 y y1 prime plus u1 y1 double prime plus u2 prime y2 prime plus um, u2 y2 double prime. Okay, now I'm gonna take all of this and plug in. Okay, so it's gonna be A2 times this business, U1 prime, Y1 prime, plus U1, Y1 double prime, U2 prime, Y2 prime, plus U2 prime, nope, plus U2, Y2 double prime plus A1 times YP prime, which is U1, Y1 prime plus U2, Y2 prime plus the A0 times the Y, which is the U1, Y1 plus u2, y2, okay? All of that equals f. Okay, so now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna reorganize. Okay, so all of the stuff that's hitting u1 prime, it's gonna be a2, Y1 prime Hold on a second. That's supposed to be double. And I have a so that's YP. So YP double prime that's missing the prime, boom. Okay, so U1 prime is getting A2 Y1 double prime, okay? So I dealt with that term. And then U1 prime, um, where else is U1 prime? It's supposed to be there. Right? Hold on. I got primes disappearing on me. Okay. So I'm there. I think I'm good. Okay, so U1 prime is getting, come on, stay in touch. Plus, a1, Y1 prime, I've dealt with that one, plus these are supposed to be plus where, where am I screwing this up? So here's YP. Okay, so this is missing and that is missing. No, it's not. Okay, so I don't wanna read. Okay. What am I doing wrong? So the U1 prime is getting A2, Y1 prime, A1, 
y1 these are supposed to be primes yeah let's let's do this instead so my pen is screwing me all up i'm gonna have to write bigger okay so our yp keep it up here the yp started as u1 y1 plus u u2 y2 okay so we took the derivative here was the one condition that we came up with and so this is what we were left with now i'll do the yp double prime again okay so it's u1 prime y1 prime plus u1 y1 double prime u2 prime y2 prime plus u2 y2 double prime okay now i'm plugging in to get a2 times u1 prime y1 prime u1 y1 double prime u2 prime y2 prime plus u2 y2 double prime plus the a1 times the yp prime which ended up being this and then the a0 times the y all of that equals f okay now if i collect up the stuff that's multiplying u1 it's going to be a2 y1 double prime i dealt with that one and then this one a1 y1 prime and then this one a0 y1 and then if i collect up all the stuff that gets the u2 it's going to be a2 y2 double prime plus a1 y2 prime plus a0 y2 and then plus everything that's left over okay so that's been dealt with that's been dealt with that's been dealt with so what's left is this a2 now oh, you know what we should have just divided through by the a2 okay so if we divide through by the a2 what we're left with is this it's um u1 prime y1 prime u2 prime y2 prime equals f so divide both sides by the a start off with the a with the, the mnemonic and you get this okay so this is now the system of equations that you use now in practice it's a lot easier than what we have okay so the system that we solve is once we find y1 and y2 the system is u1 prime y1 plus u2 prime y2 equals zero and then u2 prime y1 prime plus then that's supposed to be a one 
u1 prime y1 prime plus u2 prime y2 prime is equal to the f. Okay. Okay, so let's see this in action here. Okay, so for example, let's suppose I've got y double prime minus y prime minus 2y equals, um, how about, how about, uh, e to the three x, okay? So step one, we're gonna solve y double prime minus y prime minus two y equals zero. The auxiliary is m minus two, m plus one. So y one, is e to the 2x and y2 is e to the negative x. Okay. All right. So now what we do is we set yp equal to u1, y1, plus u2, y2. Now we need to go through and find u1 and u2. Okay, well, the system that we have is that u1 prime y1, u2 prime, y2 equals zero, u1 prime, y1 prime, u2 prime, y2 prime equals f. Okay, so this ends up being u1 prime e to the 2x plus u2 prime e to the negative x equals zero and two u1 prime e to the 2x minus u2 prime e to the negative x is equal to that guy. So now we just solve the system. Well, if you add the two equations together, you're gonna get three u1 prime e to the 2x equals e to the 3x so that means that u1 is one third e to the x, u1 prime. So that means that u1 is gonna be this one third e to the x. Okay, and then if I use the top equation, u1 prime one third e to the x times e to the 2x plus u2 prime e to the negative x equals zero. I'm gonna have that u2 prime is negative one third e, divide, multiply everything by e to the x, e to the four x, so that means that u2 is gonna be negative one over 12 e to the four x. So that means our particular solution is going to be u1 y1. So y1 was the two x. Now that's u2. u1, one third e to the x, u1, y1, 
e to the 2x plus u2 minus 1 over 12 e to the 4x minus x e to the 3x. So that looks like it's going to be 4 over 12 minus 1 over 12, 3 over 12, which is 1 over 4 e to the 3x. And so the general solution is C1 e to the 2x, C2 e to the 3x plus this dangling particular solution. Okay. Okay, now what we find that if the f of x is of a certain form, like if you go back to the original problem, y double prime plus a1 y prime, putting it in this form, a0 y equals f. If f of x is an e to the rx sine of bx or cosine of bx or an x to the n or some combo of these things, and sometimes we can avoid this variation of parameters, mumbo jumbo all together. It's, but this method always works. Okay, so now I'm gonna do a harder problem that's gonna involve perhaps an integral that might be a little challenging. So let me find, I can't just randomly write these things down. So let me find one. Um, there we go. Okay. You can't be right. Hold on a second. Jeez. We jumped on the A's, got three runs in the first, and then they just tied it up and went on to the second hit picture. Five. Okay. There we go. Okay. So let's try this one. Here. Okay, so here we go. Y double prime minus three Y prime plus two Y is equal to Yeah. Change this to minus two y prime plus y. Well, one one that's going to be e to the t divided by t squared. Okay, so step one, we solve y double prime minus 2y prime plus y equals zero. 
our auxiliary is m squared minus 2m plus 1 equals 0, which is m minus 1 squared equals 0. Okay, so we have two answers. Y1 is e to the t. And then remember that next thing, you just put a t in front of the guy. Okay, so now as far as our variation of parameters goes, our particular answer that we're looking for is going to be u1, y1, plus u2, y2. And the system is u1 prime y1, u2 prime y2 equals 0. And then all of the prime guys, all of that's got to add up to the f. OK, so let's see here. We're going to have e to the t times u1 prime plus t e to the t u2 prime equals zero. And then the next one is going to be this derivative, which is itself. This derivative, which is going to be e to the t plus t e to the t e two prime equals e to the t divided by one plus t squared. Okay. If I divide everything by e to the t, I'm going to get u one prime plus t u2 prime equals 0, then u, u1 prime plus 1 plus t u2 prime equals 1 over 1 plus t squared. OK, so I think if I go negative 1 times this row, and add it to that, I'm going to get u2 prime equals 1 over 1 plus t squared. So now we know that u2 is the tan inverse of t. Now u1 prime plus t over 1 plus t squared, that's got to equal zero. So u1 prime is negative t over one plus t squared. So u1 is going to be negative one half the log 1 plus t squared. OK. And I think I would probably do it like negative log 1 plus t squared. And maybe I'd even move the log ins the negative inside. And what was y1? y1 way back up here e to the t and t e to the t. OK. So the general, so well, the yp now, which is going to be u1 y1. So that's going to be negative e to the t times the log. I don't want to write it like that. I'm going to write it as 
e to the t times the natural log of one over radical one plus t squared plus t e to the t times the tan inverse of t. So the general solution is going to be C1 e to the t plus C2 t e to the t plus this particular solution. which you might be able to write a little nicer, but I picked it because it was ugly. Okay, well, all of this theory is still valid. But what if we have non-constant coefficients, okay? So let me look up something real quick here. I wanna find the place where it's gonna have the examples. That I want. Uh, non constant coefficients. All right, so let's try something like this. So like, for example, suppose we had y double prime, or let's suppose that we had y prime equals y. Okay, now we know what the solution is solution is y equals e to the x, right? But let's pretend that we hadn't discovered that yet. Okay, that the function, the exponential function, we hadn't discovered, but we knew about power series. What we could do is we could set y equal to some kind of a series, and we'll do a Maclaurin series here, okay? Now the goal here is to find the C sub n's, okay? So if we look at our Y prime, it's gonna be the sum from zero to infinity, N, C N, X to the N minus one, which we might as well start the sum at one, uh, n c n x to the n minus one and if we the first exponent is going to be zero so if we go back to zero then we're going to have to change this to n plus one c n plus one and then it's just going to be x to the n and the powers start with x to the zero. Okay, now y prime minus y equals zero. That means that the sum from zero to infinity, n plus one, cn plus one, xn, minus the sum zero to infinity, cn x to the n has to be zero. 
So what that's telling me is that if you combine all of this up, minus CN, all of this stuff is getting added up and it's gonna have to equal zero. Well, if a polynomial equals zero, all of its coefficients equal zero. So that means that n plus one, cn plus one is equal to cn, or the n plus first coefficient is the nth coefficient divided by n plus one. Okay, so now when you start going n equals zero, we have C zero. This is gonna be the arbitrary constant. When n is equal to one, C one is gonna be C zero over, when n is zero, C, no, I got this wrong. C1 is going to be the arbitrary guy over 1. When n is 1, C2 is going to be C1 over 2 but that C zero over one times two. When N is equal to two, C three will be C two over three, but that's C zero over three times two times one. So you see what's happening here? C four, is going to be C0 over 4 factorial. And in general, C sub n is going to be the C0 divided by n factorial. So that means that y is the sum from 0 to infinity, C0, and then it's one over n factorial x to the n, which is c times the sum zero to infinity x to the n over n factorial. Okay, now we all recognize that as e to the x, right? So apparently this is something. Like if we have a power series, I mean, if we have a differential equation that Pick up a little bit, sorry, that doesn't have constant coefficients, maybe this is a way of getting after these things. Okay, so let me let me find one here in a second. Still looking, hold on.
I'm gonna go straight to the source. I got, I'm gonna find one that's not gonna confuse me. I don't know. Okay. Okay, so here we go. So we're going to look at this guy. Y double prime minus 2xy prime minus 4y equals 0. All right, now these things kind of get involved. Now on your take home test is where one or two of these will be. It won't be on the final won't be on the test for tomorrow, but on the take-home test. Now, what we're going to have to do is find... Real quick, the take-home test will also go up tomorrow? Yeah, okay. just, just like a normal end of the semester, give you test four, test five, mm -hmm. we'll the take-home, okay? Okay, so what we're going to do here is we're going to... We go through our stuff at this allergy. I'm going on all the... Okay, so solution. What we do is we're going to set y equal to some kind of a power series. Now, when you get into this officially, they start talking about regular power series and um, singular points and stuff like that. So for us, we're just gonna be doing this. Now, I don't feel like I can leave you in good faith without at least going through this once with you because this is how everything actually gets done in the real world. Nothing works out like, oh, you get a nice little pectoring problem. Maybe you approximate to that. And N minus one, AN, X the N minus two. Okay, so now what we're gonna do is a little bit of relabeling, okay? So this guy, we might as well start at one, okay? Because the first term isn't going to be there. Now, this guy starts with powers of x being zero. Okay. So, let's just leave it like that for now. And this guy, we might as well start at two, right? because the first two terms kind of look like that. Okay, so now when we plug in, so the first guy goes two to infinity, n, n minus one, a n, x to the n minus two minus then n equaling zero to infinity 
there's going to be a two, then the n, then the a n, and then this is going to be x to the n because of multiply by x. Okay. That's supposed to be a one. Doesn't matter if you start with zero anyway. But the first non-zero thing here is going to have an x in it. Okay. And then minus the sum n equaling zero to infinity of four a sub n x to show another home run. That's Tyler Chapman's second home run tonight. Matt Chapman. Back to back to bats. Okay, all of this equals zero. Okay, now what we need to do is get all of the coefficient counter things to line up. So first of all, all of these powers start at zero. So I'm going to change the, the, the counter. So I'm going to call k equals n minus 2. Okay, so when n is 2, k is 0. So now this is going to go k going from 0 to infinity, k plus 2, and then k plus 1, a sub k plus 2, x to the k, OK? And then this is going to be minus, I'll change this counter, k going from 1 to infinity, then it's going to be 2k ak x to the k minus then k equaling 0 to infinity for a k x to the k. OK, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to pluck off the first constant terms. OK, so this guy, when k is 0, is going to be 2 times 1 a 2 plus okay the sum now it's going to start at 1 go to infinity okay now i don't have to pluck anything off of that one because it's starting with x to the first power. x to the k. Now this one I'm going to pluck off the first one. When k is 0, it's 4a0 x to the 0 plus the sum k equaling 1 to infinity ak x to the k. Okay, so now here's what we get. 2a2 two two minus 4a0 plus the following sum. Everything is multiplied by x to the k. k plus 2, k plus 1 a sub k plus 2, then minus, then it's going to be 2k a k plus, now then, then minus, 
2K, AK, plus AK, X to the K, all of this equals zero. Okay, so here's what we know. From this condition right here, we can say that 2A2 minus 4A0 has to be zero because there's no numbers on the other side, right? So this is telling me that A2 is equal to 2A0. All right. Now, as far as the rest of this goes, the condition here is gonna be k plus two times k plus one, a sub k plus two minus, or then plus one minus two k, a k. You know what, it's gonna probably be better for me to write that the other way. minus then 2k minus 1 ak equals 0. So this tells us that ak plus 2 is going to be 2k minus 1 divided by um, K squared plus 2K plus 2, or K squared plus 3K plus 2, right? But I, I, did, I did something wrong here. There's a 4 that didn't go along for the ride. It's not the one on the outside that you have there, 2A squared minus 4A to the 0? Yeah, that condition is there, but this there was a 4 that was on missing. On the far there. right, the 4AK, yeah. Yeah. So that'd be the plus 4AK. So instead you have minus 2K, you have minus 4, right? Yeah, so what this is going to be is this first piece, and then it's two. I'll erase this all shit. And then it's going to be, okay. Wait, why couldn't you have just kept that there and then had a minus four? Like, so see where you're at um, with a minus times 2K minus one. Couldn't you have just done minus 2K minus one? Minus 2k minus 4 ak, like so. So now this piece changes to minus 2k minus 4. So now this piece is 2K see now see that? There was another one minus I missed. So now this is going to be plus 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 over k plus two, k plus one. Okay, now by the way, guys, this is how this goes. All right, there's just no easy way to explain this. Okay, so now what, what you do is you start enumerating. What's gonna end up happening is we're gonna get two separate series, generally evens and odds. Sometimes, however, you get powers of three, and then six, and then nine, and then powers of other things. You know, just have to see where the problem takes you. Okay, so when k is equal to zero, we already know that a2 is equal to two a sub zero. Now let's verify it in our formula. Two K plus two divided by K plus two 
AK plus one. So AK plus two is equal to two over K plus one AK. That's not a bad formula to be following. Okay, so when K is zero, A2 did equal to A1. When K is equal to one now, A3 is gonna be two over two A1. Now it's better to not simplify, okay? There are going to be two arbitrary constants. Looks like A0 and A1 are going to be them. Okay, now we'll go back to K equal two. So when K is equal to two, A4 is equal to two over three A2, which is equal to two squared over three A0. And when K is equal to three, a5 is equal to 2 over 4 a3 which is 2 squared over 2 times 4 a1 and i know it's real tempting to simplify but trust me you know on okay so now k equaling 4 a sub 6 is going to be 2 over 5 a4 but that's 2 cubed over 3 times 5 a sub 0 and we're going to start getting one of those wacky 2 times 3 or 5 3 times 5 times 7 type thing when k is equal to 5 a7 is 2 over 6 times A5. So that's 2 cubed over 2 times 4 times 6, A1. Okay, I think one more each. And I think we'll have it. When K is equal to 6, A8 is going to be 2 over 7 a6 which is 2 to the fourth power divided by 3 times 5 times 7 a sub 0 and when k is equal to 7 a9 is 2 over 8 and that's going to be 2 to the fourth over 2, 4, 6, 8, a sub 1. Okay. So I want us all to notice that this is a sub 1 divided by 4 factorial because there's four twos here that can cancel those guys, okay? So we have two different possibilities, okay? So when, when it's even, if K is equal to two N, okay? Maybe we have to do another one. Let's 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 go one more just to see this. Okay, when k is equal to eight, a sub ten is going to be two over nine a sub sub eight, which is going to be two to the fifth over three, five, seven, nine. When K is equal to nine, 
a sub 11 is going to be a1 over 5 factorial. Okay, so for the evens, a sub 2n, well, it looks like it's 2 to the n divided by one times three times five, all the way up to whatever two N was minus one yeah. times A sub zero. I think that looks right. And for odd, our a sub odd exponent is going to be a1 divided by, okay, now for a9, that was 2n What should happen there? Hold on a second. Um, okay, so A1, should this be K factorial down here? What do you think? Yes. Let's see. Okay, so A9, how do you write nine? Nine is A sub nine. So Yeah, it's the 2n plus 1. So here the n is 4. 9 is 2 times 4 plus 1. I meant to write that up here. See that a sub 2 times 4 plus 1 that's a, a sub nine, right? So anyways, this is the K factorial or A sub two N plus one is equal to A one over N factorial. Okay, so we have two series. Okay, so we'll call Y zero the first series and it's going to be the sum from zero to infinity come on pen what's wrong with this and equaling zero to infinity then it's going to be two to the n then it's going to be one three five two n minus one um x to the two n right okay but remember that we had to start with the first term. Remember how we, we plucked that guy off? Way back up here. Okay. And so we got, here it is right here. 
this piece. Okay. So we'll just put a one there and then an A0 is going to go in the front. Okay. So sometimes, sometimes you have to kind of, you know, attach these things to these guys. So y sub zero is one, then plus the sum n equaling one to infinity of two to the n one, three, five, two n minus one, x to the two n. And then y two is the sum zero to infinity, then it's gonna be x to the odd powers divided by n factorial. Now, if these were important enough functions for us, the general solution is going to be this a zero y zero plus a one y one. Okay, now before we leave this, this is what I'm looking for. I want you to be able to get the whole series. Generally, what happens is they're always on take home exams because it takes a long time and then people don't even try. They just plug them into Wolfram or some other Mathematica and it just spits out like the first four terms and says dot, dot, dot. I'm telling you, that's not how to do these. Okay, so let me give you one to practice. Um, so, this, this one, it's kind of dark. Um, the only one they had. Uh, the other example was rough, but the kind of thing that I think you should be looking at is stuff like this. Like, for example, you try this one, and then tomorrow or later tonight, you can text me, and I can tell you whether you got it right or wrong. I mean, email me. Why double prime? Minus x squared y minus three X Y equals zero. Okay, now all of that variation of parameter stuff that we did still holds for all this stuff. So if I had an F of X over there, you know, you could work that out. Okay, so like I said at the beginning of class, all of this material with the exception of the power series solution stuff is all of this second order business. This is actually in the COR. So wherever you're transferring, they're going to expect that you have seen this because it says so right there in the COR, okay? For some reason, they don't, they haven't been, uh, including that chapter and it's an easy fix dana can just put it back in i think someone mariana has kind of taken over decision making for the department you know she decides and then she apologizes later type of thing you know and i'm not blaming her none of us none of us want to decide anything we're all lazy Shit, none of us don't even go back to work it's too easy to do this on the couch um, but anyways, that was probably what happened. Um, Dana said, you know, we can customize th these books. And Mary and I said, well, none of us are covering that material. It's there for a reason. You guys that are econ majors um, and 
bio majors that only need math 180 and 185. It was decided a long time ago by a bunch of experts better equipped to answer questions than me that this was the correct thing to do. Now, Art and I go a step further in this power series stuff because you know we know what awaits you. Now, most of these things you do plug into packages and stuff like that. Um, but um, like I said, it, it sometimes won't give you what you want. Okay, now here's what to get ready for tomorrow. Okay, I got, I got eight questions. And let's see, I have find a McLaurin series, find a Taylor series, find a power series, find a power series, find a power series. Okay, so one, two, three, four, five, find a power series. Now these are all manipulated. It's somehow manipulating that geometric series, okay? Then I'm gonna have you find the Taylor series of some fractional exponent. You know, so I, like maybe tonight practice, I'm telling you, this is not the one on the test. F of X equals X to the one third power. It's not that, but that's in the book and try it and, and see what you can come up with, okay? Now again, I want the entire series. Okay, so then I've got two error questions. One of them involves using the McLaurin series to integrate e to the negative x. And I'm asking, how many terms do we need to get a certain amount of accuracy? This ball is going to ground into an ending. We have two on. Oh, shit. Yeah, you're kidding. I'm a kid catcher. Okay. A Chapman kid. He is a, his dad is a friend of my buddies. Okay, and then I've got for the problem that you had to find the Taylor series of, the hard one, I'm asking you how far out do you need to go in the Taylor expansion so that the difference between the nth Taylor polynomial and the function is less than a certain number? Okay, so now I imagine you're going to be digging around in, in, uh, in, you know, in, in the textbook, you know, looking for Taylor's formula and stuff like that. I actually don't feel that badly about this, to tell you the truth, because if we were out in the real world and you had a job and you had to get these problems done, and you didn't use the resources available, you did, oh, this is my best guess. And the bridge falls down or whatever you're making doesn't work. Uh, I don't know. So there, there's, there is a, some kind of silver lining in all this. So any other questions? I think so. No. no. How you been? Good. Been good. Uh, we had a beach house. That was good. And all the family came down. And then the guy that actually introduced uh, me and my wife, they, him and his wife were there. So we got to catch up with them. That's good. And then yesterday, Shannon went kayaking. We finally found the spot where to put the kayaks in the, in the bay. Where do you guys go? Near uh, like Bear Flag area or? Okay, so what you do is you go down to the peninsula and when you get to the light to go on to Lido Island, you hit the left. Yeah. Okay, you go past the Lido Theater and okay. then eventually you get to a place where you're gonna turn left and drive over a bridge. Yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah, to get to, to, get to Lido Island. You're right near uh, right. Bear Flag and all that area. Okay, Blue so Park. right there, there's a shack where a guy rents kayaks and paddle boards. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And there's a paid nowhere. parking lot. There's paid parking there. Yeah. And you can launch the things. And so you don't have to fight, you know, the current, the North Atlantic to, you know, get into the, into the thing. So, oh, error, nice. Trout scored. So 
Yeah, so they did that yesterday. And then Good. my $500 e-bikes are a big hit. That's fine, everybody. everybody. That's fine, everybody, right? Yeah, I went mountain biking today on my e-bike. I guess and... for a while there was like such a big deficit. I had a buddy who sold one of his mountain bikes and actually made money and then bought a new mountain bike with the extra 800 bucks that he made off his old mountain bike. So silly. Because I guess people are just have nothing to do. Well, the hot thing right now is everybody wants an e-bike. Yeah. But an e 